Bruce Fenton. Again, my name is Skip Murphy, and as the sign says, welcome to your Granite Rock Gauntlet, which is our version of the newspaper's round table, except we ask far different questions, and we don't do softballs. Uh, we do not do gotchas, unlike uh, George Hansel, who decided that we do. Well, too bad for George. This is what happens when you get, uh, when you dis Granite Rock, we dis back. Uh -huh. So if you, uh, since he got uh, endorsed by uh, Governor Baby Huey right off the bat, this is what he deserves. So, anyways, thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me. And uh, you know what we'll do is just we'll just go round robin with questions, and when somebody falters, we'll just miss and wait for them to come back. And sometimes we have set questions, and sometimes we're just going to riff off of what you do. Okay. So, the first thing I want to ask is why are you running and why, as a libertarian, are you running in the Republican Party whose establishment wing of the party hates libertarians? Yes. Well, I'm running because of where our world is right now. I think our world is in a very key place in its history. Uh, every hundred years or so, we tend to have these big shifts in the way the world works, where borders change and money changes and systems change and who we trust changes. And I think we're going through that right now. And when these types of things historically happen and you have this chaos and shaking up of systems, sometimes it turns out well for humanity, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes certain people do well and certain ones do not. And I think it's especially key right now that America gets this right. In other words, I think that in this shakeup of the craziness of the world, especially over the last couple of years, but you know, a long cycle of debt and a lot of other problems, but particularly this tyranny over the last couple of years, um, we have to make sure that we don't go down a path that continues that. We have to go down a path that embraces our values of our constitution and human rights and liberty and freedom and the Bill of Rights. And so that's why I'm running, because I think it's a very, very key time right now. And I think we absolutely need people like me down there. And I think I can win this. It's very, it's also, the timing of this particular election at this particular time, I think it's sort of meant to be. I can, I can win it. And as far as why to do it as a Republican, that's, ex that's exactly you know, the, the, the name of the game, winning. Uh, it's very difficult to win as a libertarian. I identify myself as a libertarian. It's even in my literature and on my website. Um, and I was registered independent up until fairly recently, a couple months ago, when I when I got into this process. Uh, but historically, I had been Republican. The few elected officials in Washington that I like tend to be Republicans, Liberty Republicans, people like Thomas Massey and Rand Paul. Uh, and the, the best example I can think of of anybody in government that I model myself after is, is Ron Paul, who is, who is obviously a Republican as well. So that that's why I would like to see more Libertarians uh, win as Libertarians. I would like to see more of a liberty wing of the Democrat Party. And uh, I think the liberty wing of the Republican Party is quite strong, especially here in New Hampshire, but you know, nationwide we have a few good good folks. So that's why I picked uh, Republican. Is there a liberty wing of the Democrat Party? <laughs> no, there's not a wing. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a couple people that have slight glimmers of, of libertarianism a tiny bit, but uh, I wouldn't. I w there's none that I know of. Certainly not on a federal level that are li actual libertarians, and there's definitely not a wing. <laughs> you got to get one first, though. Know? But there are some things that I think that the people on the left. This has to be a new movement by a new, a new person. But it, you know, the young people uh, are right about the problems in many cases on the left. There are Democrats who who understand some of the problems. Even Michael Moore understands pr problems. He, he, his problem is that he just has really, really bad solutions in almost all cases. And sometimes he doesn't even understand the problem. But I would like to see somebody like, uh, you know, somebody get some of that energy that AOC has with the youth and just have good ideas, actually. And even some ideas that, you know, maybe could fit with the with the Democrat brand. It's not my, it's not a big priority for me or anything. I can't fix them. Uh, we do, fortunately, on the Republican side, you do have um, even though it's a it's a it's a smaller uh, group, it is a real wing, and uh, you can find a home and find some people that share your philosophy. Sir, how would you? Somebody talked about you being a, a libertarian. How how would you distinguish uh, libertarian positions from 
uh, say the Republican, New Hampshire Republican platform. A lot of, there's a lot of overlap. Uh, there's a lot of people who give lip service to sort of Republican ideals that are also libertarian ideals like the Constitution, for example. I mean, I think the Constitution is one of the most unifying factors that Republicans have. You know, there's quite a few different types of Republicans. Um, and, you know, so I, I think that, you know, less government, some of these things, you know, they, they've been sort of abused in the Republican Party a lot. You know, there's been a lot of, um, you know, very non-liberty, non-libertarian things. There's a lot of, there's a lot of parts of the Republican Party and, and uh, you know, things that the Republicans have done that I don't agree with. The wars are the biggest examples, you know, George, George W. Bush's wars. Um, a lot of things that George W. Bush did, I thought were, you know, expansion of the state, things that I, you know, disagree with. So there's, there's things that, it's not so much the platform. There isn't anything, I'd have to take a look at the, at the, at the official platform. There isn't anything that comes, come, that jumps out at me that I disagree with. I think that what we usually see is, at both the state and federal level, is Republicans who are, I mean, the term rhino is, is sort of misused too, because, or, or, or I, it's not a great term. I shouldn't say it's misused, it depends who's using it, but it's not a great term because it doesn't always differentiate you know, why you think that. I, I prefer to use liberty as a litmus test, and there's definitely Republicans at the state and federal level who, who aren't following liberty, in my opinion. Um, I can't think of a, of a, um, of a platform issue that, that I disagree with, but it's, it's mainly like the implementation of liberty policies, you know, how, how uh, mo most Republicans locally and, and, or, you know, you know, statewide and federally, they just don't follow the constitution. They don't follow these principles properly. Well, I, I, I think I would, uh, I would well, agree with that. I've somebody often, else coming. I, I've often said that, uh, the, the Tea Party, uh, decided to adopt traditional Republican principles because the Republican Party has abandoned them. Right. Uh, and the other thought I have every time I get a, an advertisement from the Republican Party that says, you gotta support conservatives, I, I say to myself, when did the Republican Party ever support conservatives? Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, especially now we have even guns. I mean, even guns are being abandoned by a lot of Republicans. I mean, gun rights, you know, and this tyranny of the last couple of years where you had Republicans that sometimes stood by and sometimes supported this kind of thing, you know, where we had this uh, unprecedented cra crackdown on human rights, un unprecedented loss of, of our freedoms here at home. And there was Republicans that aided it or, say, or stood by and didn't fight it. And uh, so, you know, that I think is a violation of Republican values. Hi, Steve. Hi, guys. Hello, how are you? Let me move over. I have trouble hearing anyway. Okay. You're, you're a soft spot. Hey there, I'm Bruce. I made it. Well, I'm glad. I made you the offer. I'd bring you over and bring you back. Oh, I didn't see that. Oh. I, you know, uh, no, <laughs> get back. My wife had to have a procedure up at Raptor right. Hitchcock. Oh. She, <laughs> got, she got this damn ulcers uh, oh, okay. on the bottom of her foot. And edema in the left leg, something Have a seat. Yeah. Have, yeah. A seat. Have a seat. So Have a seat. we're just uh, just <laughs> just, just, just starting the interview process. Hi. Nice to meet you. Steve Earl. Oh, Bruce, how are you? Nice to meet you. Glad to meet you. Just so you know, Steve and, and Don are both fairly prolific letter writers to the the local paper, what I refer to as Pravda on the Lake. But that is prolific, because that like to be. Well, yeah, you used to, you used to write a little more, but you still... <laughs> well, they don't give us a lot of paper, do they? Well, it doesn't well, they, matter. It's, so it's, they call the Laconia Daily Sun, but I refer to it as Pravda on the Lake. They, they've definitely taken a left turn in the past few years, and they've cut down the size of the letters that they permit now. Oh, interesting. And they've given you, like, you're limited to one week and stuff huh. like that. One so, a week and 300 words. Right. Huh. Which is why I have expanded. <clears throat> we have granite rock, uh -huh. but we also have what we call micro rocks. Oh, so nice. we have one that was Guilford Grot because mm -hmm. there were not all. Yep, the three of us um, that would write for it. But I've now expanded it to Lakes Region Grot. So for those people who want to write more, we need to get them to say, "Come and write for uh, Lakes Region Grot." Yes. And by the way. Don is also the head of the Lakes Region Tea Party, which well, is one of the few that still exists. 
and Granite Rock was a co-founding member of the New Hampshire Tea Party Coalition back in the day. Great, and I'm one of the founders of the Concerned Citizens Group. Oh, okay. yes. Yeah, so we, we consider our, ourselves political activists first that happen to have a rather large voice here in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. We, as um, AFP New Hampshire has called us, uh, Greg Moore, we punch well above our weight. Nice. Because we are all volunteers. And nobody is, we don't have a payroll. Oh, good for you. Yeah. That's so, great. damn it. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. I know. <laughs> I, I want to raise. <laughs> no guest honorarium. You're going to double my salary? Yep. Oh, All right. I love the math. Zero times two is. That's racist, is that the math? isn't it? <laughs> uh, what does Common Core have to say about that math? Yeah, don't, don't get me started. I'm trying to deal with the grandson's uh, math classes in kindergarten, so I, I will have much to say about yeah. that. But anyways, we are diverging. Um, so we were talking about platform, the Republican platform versus libertarian ideals and yep. ideas. Uh, there are some things uh, within the platform that are not exactly libertarian. Uh, the, the, uh, there's positions dealing with marriage, there's positions dealing with abortion, which I think the libertarians for the most part, as I understand libertarianism, having read a lot of stuff from Cato. Um, but basically, the government should just stay out of some areas. Yes. But the Republican platform has some, some areas that take positions that are probably not really libertarian. Uh, that being said, I have written for the Grok and elsewhere that you don't have to agree with 100% of the Republican platform. But, you know, pick a number, whether it's 70% or 80% or 90%. But if you get below 70%, as far as your, what you support and believe in, I think you're in the wrong party. You right. need to change parties. So I don't think you have to, I, I can see where a libertarian could be a, a Republican, could support the Republican platform generally. Maybe not every little, little piece of it. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so that's something that you need to familiarize yourself with and be prepared to deal with, I don't know if there's going to be any campaign debates or anything like that, but you know, some people may, may try to focus you on those, those issues. Yeah. yeah. You've already had a couple of debates. Yeah. We've had, we, well, there's been one. Yeah. yeah I, 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 your journal. Yep. Um, a couple of weeks ago or last week or something like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me ask you one of the things I write about a lot. Um, and I will admit to being what, we call a conservatarian, mm -hmm. conservative with small l libertarian leanings, because the more I study our early history, the more I come to appreciate the absolute genius. And of course, the Declaration of Independence, as uh, I, I put this up as a blog line of the day yesterday, the Declaration has a specific ordering of what is to happen. Indiv individual rights first, then government. And we're seeing that being, if not already, flipped, flipping. Mm. But here, here's what I want to ask. Because you will be at the federal level, that's the topmost uh, level of government, there are other levels of government. So I always ask the question, what is the proper role of government between all four levels? And this could be a very short uh, answer or a very long answer. We've got plenty of time. And, these cameras will last 10 hours. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the, the proper role of all government, in my opinion, is to protect the life, liberty, and property of individuals. Uh, and that can, in, that can sometimes include things like enforcement of contracts. And then there's a few sort of miscellaneous things like having uh, embassies so you can have your visa work, so you can leave the country and come back and things like that. But... Generally, that's what I'd like to see government limited to, protecting life, liberty, and property. So, so the, the legitimate roles of the federal government would be to limit itself and protect the people from the government. And in some cases, limit um, you know, you know, the, the one relation between the different levels of government, which I think is relevant, especially here in New Hampshire. There's a, there's a thought, and there's kind of two schools of thought in the libertarian you know, or, or just, you know, two, two general theories that, that, that I, you know, 
you, you, you kind of can consider in, in, in this. Um, one is sort of, you, you know, you, you have uh, everything done on the most local level possible, where you have, uh, you, you know, you, you, you have as little power at the federal level and you, and you delegate it to the states and then the states delegate to the towns. Um, the challenge with that, and I think what we saw in New Hampshire is, in my opinion, one of the very few legitimate roles of, say, the state government is to protect you from other petty tyrants. So I think the state could do more to protect from, you know, towns and school boards and things like that. And, 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 and if there was cases where a state was abusing rights, I think it's good that the federal government uh, stops the state from abusing rights. So basically the answer is, uh, you know, I, I want government limited to those roles and doing as little as possible. The one, the one thing that I think is a legitimate role of government and the one, there, there's like only a couple kind of bills that I would see myself being in favor of, you know, you know very strange circumstances where they're really needed, like a, like a war, you know, we get invaded where, you know, I actually would vote. There are cases where I would vote for a war. Um, if Rye Beach gets invaded, then there, there's a, certainly a chance that I would vote, uh, you know, for, for action on that. This kind of, you know, bombing people all over the world, you know, I, I don't vote for. Um, so having those kind of, you know, the, the, there's those cases and then, the, you know, protection of life, liberty and property. I would vote for things that de deregulate it or decrease or get rid of agencies. And then the other thing I would vote for is something that protects, like if you had states that were... Well, we have similar just recently. I mean, if you have states that are passing unconstitutional, um, you know, violations of rights on firearms or speech or something like that, then I think it is the place of the federal government to stop the states from doing that. And 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 and, and that goes, by the way, for a state. I I, uh, I think it's it's the pl place of the state to stop abuses. You know, I don't I don't agree with the oh just you know let's all do it locally kind of thing because then you can have petty tyrants like school board members or. You know, town managers or something like that, where there's you know 70 people that got them elected, and they can affect thousands of people. And in some cases, it's very very difficult to fight them, and it's it's a burden for the citizens. It's a burden to get the lawyers and things like that. So, I would like to see the government protect. You know, if they, if that answers your question about you know in in, in terms of how the levels of government. From a philosophical government. standpoint, yes. But what about actual actions? Mm -hmm. Who should be doing what and why? Well, the government overall, all the levels should be doing very little. And the reason is, the reason why is because we don't need other humans to tell us what to do, to take our money and then tell us how to do something. If something needs to be done, we don't, it'll get done. We don't need government to do it in almost every single case. There's very, very, very little that government is actually good at. And there's almost nothing that they're better at than us collectively, especially in an era of decentralization and technology where we can communicate and cooperate on the internet and, and through modern technology uh, and other means. Um, we especially don't need them. You know, the, the only thing they're really good at and quite efficient at is killing. And uh, there's very, very rare cases where that's warranted and needed. So the answer of what they should specifically do, mostly nothing. I'd like them out of our lives almost entirely. Very few roles uh, that I think they should be doing at all. So the, so the answer is I, I don't want to see government doing these things at all. If something needs to be done, the, the private sector will do it. If it's a good idea, you don't need government to do it. It'll, ha it'll happen. It'll work by itself. There's very, very little I'd like to see them do. Yeah, my younger brother lived in a town where they outsourced every single function of the town to outside entities. And their staff was only basically project managers to say, oh, we'll write the RFP and then we'll monitor it. And if you don't do a good job, we'll fire you and get the next person. So it is a doable model. Mm -hmm. But we, I may come back to that later because this is a, a philosophical question that I spent a lot of time, I have spent a lot of time on over the years. Mm -hmm. Granite Rock's been open since 2006. So we've, we've yeah. had enough time to tick off a lot of people. Good. <laughs> Steve. Hello. Your question. Back to my question. Well, you know, we see a lot of people coming into this country from all over the place. The group that I headed up, uh, Concerned Citizens, we focused our attentions on Islam. Uh, I'd like to get your impression. Uh, Islam has a gentleman, uh, 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 Bob Ozzie, comes around 
frequently given presentations called Ask a Muslim Anything. And one of his presentations, or one of his points is that Islam is very well compatible with Western democracies. What's your thinking on that? Yes, I think it is. Um, it is a big religion. There's two billion people who are Muslims, and just like Christians or any other large group, they have an extremely wide range of what they believe. And we should always be very cautious of saying Muslims believe this or they believe that, uh, because it is a huge, huge range, just like Christianity. You know, we have, it's not just Protestants and Catholics who may disagree in Ireland or something like that. Christianity is much more broad than that. We have the Lord's Resistance Army of Uganda who believes that you can, you should chop off arms and things like that. And most Christians would say, oh, those aren't Christians. Uh, just as most Muslims will say the Taliban is not, you know, practicing the faith. The overall idea of Islam is uh, submission to God and a belief in one God and only one God, and that the Prophet Muhammad is his messenger. And originally when Islam was first uh, spreading, it was considered by many to be a natural progression of Christianity and Judaism. And it was, and, and you know, one thing that a lot of people are not aware of today is that uni universally Muslims believe that they believe in the same God as Christians and Jews. It's the God of Abraham. And they also believe in Jesus Christ. They believe in Moses. They believe in Noah. They believe in the Virgin Mary and the Virgin Birth. So there's more in common that, that people have uh, with Islam than I think people realize. And I think it's absolutely um, compatible with, with Western ideals, uh, depending on which interpretation. You know, there's interpretations of Christianity that are probably not compatible, and there's certainly interpretations of Islam. Uh, I lived in Saudi Arabia. Um, I do not agree with their, their uh, it's obviously not a libertarian state, and I don't agree that their method of managing the state and their method of state control is not something that I uh, agree with. That is a different interpretation. You know, there's different interpretations. There, there, there are certainly libertarian Muslims and, and, and others. And I think at the core, uh, the three great religions all have something in common at their core, which is a, being against harming other people. And so in, in that respect, I think it can be very compatible with libertarianism. And, um, you know, the West is a tr tricky idea too, because the West is... You know, the United States already has millions of Muslims. You know, it's, it's already, um, you know, it, it already is the West in some yeah. ways. Yeah. Know? What do you think, uh, uh, you know, you're going more onto the philosophical. I'm thinking of the practical. Mm -hmm. uh, what what uh, do you feel would be, how would it mesh? Instead of talking about just the, the uh, uh, different varieties of it, the basic ideology, how do you see that? Is that, that pretty much the same as uh, our natural government philosophy? Yeah. Is it pretty much the same as a Christian philosophy? Or is it, uh, does it differ in a way that would or possibly uh, conflict yeah. with those. I, I don't mean violently conflict, I mean right. ideologically. I don't think so. I think that it's naturally, I think Islam is, a, is, is, is peaceful, and I think that the core of Islam uh, is often misunderstood by many people or misinterpreted or whatever, but I, I think that, um, you know, the Quran talks about you being peaceful to other people. So I think that that is, is compatible. The Quran also talks about to your religion, your own, my religion, my own kind of thing. So it, it is accepting of other religions. And if you look back at the histories of Islam, you look at uh, Muhammad's first um, you know, society in Mecca, it was very opening. There was, there was Jews there. There was, yes. you know, it, 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 it's an opening thing. And, uh, you know, Mecca historically had been a very vibrant cultural center because people came from all over the world and people mm -hmm. were, were accepted. So, uh, you know, and, and our system in the United States 
is a system that can be independent of religion. You can run for office and your religion shouldn't matter. You know, your, your beliefs shouldn't, shouldn't affect, my beliefs shouldn't affect, and would not affect my uh, actions. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, you know, I, I, think it, I think it can be uh, compatible for sure. Don. Well, I wasn't going to go this way, but um, in the United States, you could run for office holding, believing in any religion of the whatever it is, 57 Muslim countries. How many of them can you run for office and hold office as a Christian? Well, have countries that... Uh, I, don't know, I don't know the answer, but I don't know of any. Yeah. I, th I think that's a state problem more than a religion problem. It's it's an interpretation of the religion. You know, we're we're a Muslim country in some ways because we have millions of, of Muslims. We're not a you know there's there's countries that have a lot of Muslims that have not become an Islamic state. I think the countries that are Islamic states, you know, Iran, Saudi Arabia, these kind of countries, then they they are making their own interpretation of of the religion and then extending that to the state. And not everybody agrees with that. Not all Muslims agree with that. And even those countries don't agree with each other. You'll notice, you know, there's there's differences of opinions of, of those countries. I personally think that it is difficult to have a religious run state, certainly impossible in America and impossible in our system. Um, you know, there's just all kinds of, of challenges with that. I think that our system is, a, is the better model. Let everybody yeah. do their own thing believe what they want. And where I would, you know, where, where the state comes into it is, you, it goes both ways too. You gotta let everybody do their own thing, but also you can't let them try to make somebody do something. Like what you're, what you're seeing in the UK now is um, there, there's some people that are trying to push their religion. They say, you should wear this or you should do this, push their religion on somebody else. But if you violate somebody else's rights, the, you know, those, those, that person needs to be protected. Everybody should be protected to do what they choose, what peaceful action they do. Now, if somebody wants to convince them, that's fine, yeah. but uh, nobody should be forcing anybody to do anything. Well, a couple of things I've noted is, uh, round, <laughs> hey, round, I'm, Robin, I'm sorry, Robin, yeah, Robin, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna follow I'm just, I, I'm interested. <laughs> How about following up with next? Yeah, I, he's, he's, he's just been sitting I here. I would argue that we do have religious state in the U.S. We yeah, well, it's atheism. We have a new religion. <laughs> secular, secular, you will say secular human. What I call it is the Church of Wolf. We have a new and rising religion, which is a real thing, and I think it really is very much like a religion in the sense that it has high priests and dogma and scripture and, and guilt and and authority, and uh, you have to believe in invisible things. So there there is this thing that I call the Church of Wolf, which is is uh, you, you know partly atheist, partly partly almost. Evil in self some ways. Stuff. <laughs> you know, it's uh, but it is very much like a religion, and I worry about that. <laughs> I want to come back to that point yeah. because it's something that we have fought with for a long time before it became woke. It was political correctness, and we can get into that. But Norm, your okay, question. my turn. Your turn. <clears throat> well, since it is your house, I like to. I, well, I, I like to turn to uh, one of the, the favorite topics of mine and I think of people like Rock, and that's the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. And uh, what are your views about the Second Amendment to the Constitution? Well, it speaks for itself, shall not be infringed. So I, I don't believe it should be infringed at all. So I'm against the National Firearms Act, which exists now. I would be in favor of repealing that. And so that, was, that was my next question. Would, yeah. you, would you repeal the National yeah, Firearms Act? For sure, and I'd be against any, any and all regulations of any kind against firearms. Good, that's, uh, that's, that's good. I, I do have a second, a second topic. Uh, Biden's not gonna like you if you think people can have a cannon. Biden? Why not? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> no, he Biden, says you don't. Letters of Biden Mark. won't like or dislike me it's because he's unaware of anything, even if I was sitting in front of him. Would, well, would <laughs> I would be kind of concerned about letting mentally ill people have firearms. Yeah. Or people that are proven violent felons or something like that, I think that kind of thing should be uh, at least considered having regulations against. We have laws against those. Yeah, yeah, we yeah I know, but... Uh, yeah, we, and you know, being extremely cautious 
um, you know, putting some power in, in the hands of judges in, in, in some cases, you know, extremely, you know, light uh, laws that are hard to abuse. The challenge with uh, saying mental illness, I mean, in theory, I agree. The problem is, they exactly. don't like your hat. They're going to say you're mentally ill. If you if and you question do. the election, That's you're right. mentally ill. If you sure if you do. if you if you're angry about your gun rights, you're mentally ill. You know, so we got to watch that one. Um, just like misinformation or ter terrorist groups is another big one. You know, you you know John Birch yeah, decided right. <laughs> this, this is this could easily be considered a terrorist group. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of people very broadly painting that brush. Um, yes, we we have been told. I have been told by several really progressive people that we are an extremist domestic terrorist group yeah. and I say thank you I appreciate <laughs> that the governor uh, well, our existing governor has referred to the Republican the Ogallon uh, County Republican Committee as being dominated by extremist right-wingers interesting uh, that being said let me sh switch a little bit on the from the Second Amendment since I like your answers I'll go to a different area that is <laughs> far, foreign affairs uh, what's your views regarding the relationship between the United States and the state of Israel? Well, I think that we have certainly, there, there are certainly some problems in Israel. Israel's policies, I think, are problematic. And I think that we have contributed that to that in some respect because we have done what we do a lot of times all over the world which is kind of involve ourselves in, in other things uh, other other affairs of other countries and so I think the sort of analogy with Israel would be like um, somebody goes in a bar and they know that they have like a 10 foot uh, you, you know 10 foot tall biker with heavily armed outside, you know, that person might be more likely to start a fight, you know, if they know that they have somebody outside. So in some ways, I think that our our influence has been, uh, you know, sort of problematic. You know, there's a lot of lobbying and, and I think this goes across the board. You know, when, when I see our tax dollars being spent on Israel and things like that, I think, I think that's a problem. Um, as far as Israel specifically, I think there should be a, a two-state solution, uh, I, you know, I think, um, you know, I, I, there's a lot of great things to respect about Israel. You know, they, they, they have, I think, one of the highest uh, per capita numbers of scientists, and you know, so I, I think is the Nobel Prize or something like that. They're very advanced with technology. Um, you know, there's a lot of very good things about Israel, uh, but you know, there there are some serious problems as well. Done. Done. Okay. Um, let's swing back to. Looking at it from the viewpoint of the Constitution, mm -hmm. um, what is the federal government responsible for with respect to infrastructure? And yes, this is one of my common questions I ask. With yeah. respect to what? Infrastructure. Oh. Yeah, I don't know. From, ask yeah. Steve Negro. From a constitutional standpoint, you know, I've read it, I've reread it a few times recently since running. I can't really think of a great answer for that. I mean, I know what I believe, which is, you know, minimal to none. You know, I don't really want government doing lots of in infrastructure in general. Uh, so I'm not really sure what it says in the Constitution or, you know, if there's something that I can think of that's a specific infrastructure section, if there's something I'm missing on it. But there is, is there one. What does it say? But only one. Uh -huh. It is responsible for the postal roads okay. between post offices. Oh, interesting. Period. Okay. You know, it's sort of like when Biden said, well, you shouldn't be able to own a cannon. Well, yeah, you could right from the beginning with right. words of Mark. Yeah. Um, and that's how our state got started mm -hmm. when the uh, colonialists uh, decided to drive uh, the, gov the, the king's royal governor out of his house. <laughs> they stole the cannon from the British fort <laughs> and laid it right in front of his door. Nice. <laughs> he got the picture. Yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> yes. So... Given that answer, uh -huh. what would you be doing? Because we spend a ton of money at the federal level. They take our money and then with strings attached, and that'll be another question, uh -huh. and then try to sp have us spend it in the way that they want us to. Right. Should that continue? Or would you work to say, 
why don't you just let the states keep it themselves? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would vote no. There's a one school of thought that says, you know, it's the, it's our federal money and we need more of our share. There's another school of thought, which is my school of thought, which says vote no on these things all the time. I don't want stolen money. I don't want it to be voted at all. I don't want to go to our state or anybody's state. So I want less and less and less and let people, not just the states keep their own money, but ultimately let people keep their own money. And if they really want to do something, they, they'll, they'll figure out a way it, it, it will get done. But the closer the money is to the people, the better. I mean, if the state is better than the federal, but ideally your own pocket is better than the state. So, uh, so yeah, I, I would not support, I, I don't want us take, especially these things with strings attached. I wouldn't vote for the, it's a little different. A lot of times that's voted on the state level, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't vote at the federal level to even have to spend it in the first place. And if I had the ability to vote on a state level of accepting it, I don't. No, I'd rather not accept it. I'd rather uh, you know, just have the government shrink, ideally. Okay, Steve. Well, speaking of uh, Islam, which is one of my pet things, uh, do you realize that at its root core, Islam rejects all secular governments, courts, or anything like that? Nothing secular has sway over the ideology of Islam. They have governments that are secular in the Islamic world, but they are secondary to the pressures of the uh, Islamic religion. And you will find, I think, if you study Islam like we have, uh, some of us, uh, that it, it is uh, misogynistic, homophobic, anti-Semitic, it embraces slavery, sex trafficking, and uh, all sorts of uh, things that, you know, uh, we in the West have, Pedophilia. have kind of uh, swayed away from. Uh, how do you feel about that? What's your response to that? Yeah, I don't agree. Um, there are certainly some Muslims that are misogynistic and all the other things you mentioned, just as there's some Christians. But it's a very broad religion. I don't think it's makes sense to paint two billion people, you know, w with it. Okay. And I have studied Islam. I, I know quite a bit about Islam. I'm you sorry. Know, I, I know quite a bit about Islam. Okay. Yeah. I I sort of maybe follow up a little bit on. Skip's question on the role of the government. The role of the government is, um, to a large extent, uh, dependent on how much money it has. Um, and for the first half of the existence of our country, except in time of war, our federal budget uh, averaged approximately 3% of GDP. And if, I'm not sure what the figure is today, but something like 25, 20, 24, 25%. 25%. What, uh, now, we have taken on a different role as a country and that things are different a little bit, but do you have an idea what, what, would, be, what would be your target for government, federal government share of our GDP? Because, I mean, I, I come from the standpoint that says, Every time Republicans get in a discussion with Democrats over spending, we say, oh, we want to go for this balanced budget. We can balance it at $4.5 trillion. The Democrats, oh, that's not enough. We need $7.5 trillion. So we settle on six. Yeah. I don't, so we, it, when it always expands, <clears throat> it never starts to retract to into that role of a what, what, 10, 13, whatever it is, items in the Constitution that say these are the role of the federal government. Where, how do, I don't see how we get back there, if we should get back there, I think we should, no, without we, cutting, the, cutting the spending. Yeah. So what, what do you think is the proper size of the federal government in terms of our I, I'd be curious what it was in 1910 or so, uh, you know, but I, I, think, I think it was around 2% or something. That right. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So two. So two and that's perfect. Yeah. Two and Before a half World War One. Something like that. We had to pass a constitutional amendment to have an income tax. Yeah. 
Yeah, which was 1913. Yep. So that's why I said 1910. You know. So yeah, that sounds. I was going to say two percent. That sounds about right. How much? Two percent. Two percent. Yeah. Okay, I'd go for two percent. Yeah, I mean, how, they, how are we going to get there? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that, that, that's a see. That's there's things. Question. There's things that are kind of like dreaming, and then there's things that can actually be implemented. But the interesting thing is, some of the things that are really radical or may seem radical are not possible to pass today. Don't forget, this is a six-year term, and don't forget that our world is completely in total and utter chaos, and the 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 uh, cash register is about to break. You know, we're bankrupt. And the bubble's going to pop. So I was on an interview one time, and they said, what would be your perfect bill? And I said, I don't know, something that, that eliminates 20 federal agencies with one bill, you know, one paragraph. You know, this bill hereby eliminates all these. And I kind of laughed, and I said, of course, that would never pass while I'm in the office. And then I said, well, wait a minute. Actually, it could. It could. We are in such unprecedented, it wouldn't pass today, but we are in such unprecedented crazy times. Would it really shock us? if in a year or two years from now, our world is as different as it is from two years ago. Because mm -hmm. if we have another two years like the last two years, it, we may have no choice. Even Elizabeth Warren may be saying, well, the money is not there, and it's not there, and it's not there. And we have a year of the Great Depression where people are starving. They may have no choice. And, and something like Thomas Massey's bill to get rid of the Department of Education may uh, have a chance. So, so that's why, to go back to the very first question of why I want to run now, it's because of exactly that kind of thing, because we're in such unprecedented times. We could see us return to 2% because we, we may have no choice. So even radical things like that are possible. But to your answer, you know, barring that, uh, meanwhile, I think it's just doing what you can. You know, Senate is limited in power. You're only one of 100, but you can take incremental steps. You can do filibusters. You can vote consistently no. You could potentially swing on close votes. You can work with a caucus. There's a, there's a few liberty people there now, and hopefully a few more will get elected. And that's basically what the plan there, can there be. Are, there are two things that I think are absolutely essential to have any chance for us to fight for fiscal responsibility. One is a firm commitment to always vote no on any continuing resolution. And two, always vote no on any spending bill that doesn't go through the proper process, which I understand regular ends order. up with the regular yeah. order. 13 separate bills, each one going through committee, mm -hmm. so that every senator and every, every congressman and everybody in the public has a chance to see what they're talking mm -hmm. about spending on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I would be in favor of that and take it even a step further. I would also vote for no on everything that expands government uh, or expands spending or expands the tax base. You know, I, I would be, you know, I like, I'm not a doctor, but Ron Paul was known as Dr. No. I could be known as, you know, Mr. No or something like that. You know, it's, uh, there's a lot of things. That I, and I also wouldn't vote on anything I haven't read. This idea that you get these bills that are 1,200 pages the day before you vote, I just wouldn't do it. I wouldn't vote on it. I'm not going to do it. But there's no way I would vote on that. Yeah. And there's no way I'd vote on some of these big, um, you know, I'd be pretty much a no vote on, on we almost need, all of these We need 51 things. senators, at yeah. least, who are willing to stand up and say when they get there. Yeah. I'm voting no on any continuing resolution. I'm voting yeah. no on anything. The, the, only, have... the only exception I could even think of for, for anything with spending that I could think of that I would go for is uh, VA, Veterans Benefits, because we do have a commitment to them. They made a deal when they came in and the deal isn't being honored. You know, they joined and they said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna join and you, you know, the recruiter said, you're gonna get taken care of in the medical and they're not getting taken care of. So that's kind of like honoring a deal, honoring a contract. So that's one, that's the only exception I can think of where I would vote in favor of, of, of spending or a spending increase. It, otherwise, um, you know, and there could be rare, 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 rare other examples, but, Overall, any kind of you know increase in spending, I'm against, and and then the other things that you mentioned, continuing resolutions, um, bills that I haven't read or that you don't have time to read or they haven't gone through committee properly, and those are some of the worst bills, of course. You know, these are the things that are rushed last minute, Patriot Act and things like that, and and they you know they're always trying to shove stuff in these bills, so you know that's a big problem. What's your view on uh, tariffs and foreign trade? Yeah, I think tariffs are a bad idea. I'm against tariffs overall. Um, you know, it's 
it's just you know more kind of government meddling. It's the overall big picture idea that people in fancy offices know better than the world or whatever. Um, and picking winners and losers. Yeah, picking winners. So the sanctions, same kind of thing. Sanctions are you know completely terrible. They're really, really, really harmful to a lot of people. I'm I'm big on. I would I'd like to see more freedom and more trade. But that always depends on what the other side, who is your trading partner, on, yeah. talks about. Right. Uh, quick little thing on your vote. I'm going to ask you right now, would that be a promise? And let me tell you why. Back during the Tea Party, there was somebody who wanted to go to Congress. His name was Frank Ginta. He said all the right things, and he promised multiple, multiple times that he would never turn his back on the promise that he would never vote on anything a bill or a continuing resolution that would increase the national debt, which back then was probably around three or four trillion. Now back at the you know, yeah. early 2000s. Yeah. Oh, okay. Two tens. Um, within a year and a half, he had broken his promise. Yeah. I railed on him for the next year and a half till his next election, and I am glad to be able to say that Granite Rock helped make him lose. Nice. He, <laughs> broke a, he broke a promise. And I will tell you that if you make that promise now, I will watch. I like it. And I pounded him every other day. Couldn't do it every day, but I, I tried a couple of times. So the exact wording but, is uh, vote against any time the national debt is increased? Yeah, which a continuing resolution, oftentimes yeah, they're yeah. already... Spending yeah, I would vote against the, the the one exception. Like I said, could 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 be a war, a, a, like a major war, but 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 definitely not an undeclared war. Definitely not these Afghanistan, Iraq kind of things. Not COVID. Not these fake emergencies. Yep. It would have to be a very real. And even in those cases, I would first make a priority to do it without increasing. You know, like hey, we need money for this emergency. Let's cut all this crap. You know, and do it. You know, so. Well, so that would be the only exception I could think of. Well, fighting a major war is yeah. a constitutional mandate. Right. Which is... So I'm and it should be that. declared. All right, I'm going to go back to a philosophical question. Yes. I'm trying to get this all out of my system now. Um, the founders <laughs> had a f good philosophical idea of how everything was supposed to be structured. Mm -hmm. We have individuals, we have what was supposed to be a limited government, and then civil society in the middle. Which was supposed to be the largest expanse? Who was protecting whom from what? And when did it all start to go south in your idea? So what are those three? What was the role of each? And how come it's now turned into almost just two? Can you, add, can you, can you rephrase the question? I'm just trying to figure out the best way to answer that. So sure. If you maybe, yeah, try, try to get like this. Sure. They were creating a government. Mm -hmm. the Again, fathers. individual liberties, freedom. Individual rights and freedoms. So we have individuals. Mm -hmm. They're creating a government. And then we have civil society. Proportionally, what was supposed to be the size in relationship to each other? Well, I think the... I'm not sure what the size was supposed to be, but I think the individual rights were very clearly supposed to be prioritized. Um, and by civil society, are you talking about the government portion of civil society? No, no, no totally. The oh, Constitution was meant to be a so it's individual, civil society, and government are the three. Are the, are the three. three not so much population, but influence and control. Yeah, I'm not sure how it, how it, how to answer that, but I I mean I think it should certainly be as little government as possible. Okay. Yeah. All right. It's a hard question to somebody who hasn't been reading Granite Rock for a while, but literally they, they wanted civil society to be a boundary, uh -huh. a buffer between government and individuals because through history they had seen what that problem would be when government is right up against individuals mm -hmm. with no Which is what we have now. Which is why, you know, that kind of why I have that question of, how do we restore where most of the interactions were supposed to be within civil society? We would have yeah. our own set of norms, which right. we'll go back to the woke, Church of Wokeness yes. 
at some point because you're right, we're in a norms changing environment, yeah. which mostly I would disagree with. Uh oh, I just lost my train of thought on the question. <laughs> so the church when did when did that sectioning off of self governing Mm -hmm. Individual self-government, civil society self-government, and then a yeah. limited government. When did that start to go wrong and sideways in your viewpoint? I'm not sure when it started to go wrong. I've certainly observed it in my own life. I mean, there's the great chart. Uh, WTF happened in 1971. A lot of things started to go haywire once we got on fiat, the fiat system, you know, or the, or the modern, you know, kind of debt system. So I suspect that it's pr probably around then, you know, just looking from you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, the increasing loss of freedom. I think particularly, you know, with the rise of the administrative state, the way that rules and laws have been done in recent years, you know, I think it continued 70s, 80s. We've just had less and less freedom in, in recent decades, certainly from the 90s to today. I mean, you take my career, for example, when I started as an investment advisor 30 years ago, you could open a brokerage account without an ID. You could open it over the phone. You had to pay in a week. I didn't need your ID, I didn't need your date of birth, I didn't need your social. Now, you know, we have a whole generation, the young folks that work for me, they never, they think that's the way it's always been. They think the government's supposed to always know. And in my day, you know, 30 years ago, the older brokers were like, are you out of your mind? What do you mean we have to get an ID from our customers? To them, it was just like selling a television. It'd be like going into Walmart and be like, oh, we need your name, address, social security number. And if we did that for 20 years, if they made the Ministry of Television and you had to go get, do AML, KYC, to go into Walmart, all it takes is one generation. And in 20 years, the 20 year olds, guys who work for me, they think that's normal. So um, yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly when it happened, but I, I, I think I, it's, it's been clear to observe over the last few decades, the you know, in, increasing uh, you know, government bumping up right against the individuals. And, and like you say, with the wokes, less uh, accountability and civil society holding things accountable. I mean, if you don't like what somebody's saying, deal with it yourself in society. If you want to have somebody do an action, then deal with it in society. You know, the, uh, I mean, it's interesting. You, you, you talked about Islam. In Saudi Arabia, they had two kind of, they had these, these folks called the Mutawa, the religious police, and they would enforce, they'd go and say, you have to wear a headscarf. And that was decreased uh, as, you, you know, it was, it, was, it was decreased by the government because there was a lot of drawbacks. And there's, there's a different group, voluntary group, says, hey, I think you should do this. And that, and that is a huge, and I said this a lot of times when I was in Saudi Arabia, I talked a lot about libertarianism and my looking at the society close and you know, you know, thinking about it in, in, in a way that makes sense. And there's a huge, huge, huge difference between voluntary and involuntary, huge difference. And that's civil society. And that, that also accounts for different areas. You have different, I mean, right here in the United States, we have Dearborn, Michigan, people pray five times a day. There's different, different people, are, you know, we have different standards and different uh, kind of social norms here in New Hampshire. There's a lot of things that are interestingly not, kind of not regulated, but they're just kind of known. Very few of the towns have noise ordinances, for example. There's, there's a lot of good ways to sort of self-regulate and have that, that civil society sort of regulate itself. But, that is, uh, you know, definitely decreased in recent decades as we've had the you know, government bumping up against the individual more and more and more. So I'm not sure exactly when it happened, but you know, th th that's the basic thought over the last few decades. Is there a certain well it, time or date you were thinking of? Well, it actually started uh, back in the 1880s. 1880s when Germany, uh, when uh, von von Clausewitz was rolling up the Germanic states. Okay. And he had to fight socialism. So uh -huh. he convinced, and brilliantly so, that if you give me money, I will I will give you medical care and a pension. Mm -hmm. And that forestalled the socialists. But then American academics, of which Woodrow <coughs> Wilson was chief of, mm -hmm. uh, learned of how socialism was going on and brought it back, but called it progressivism. Mm -hmm looking at human society from an anti-constitutional standpoint. They thought it was old white guys that was not relevant to the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. We were now scientific, <laughs> which turned us all into cogs into their social engine. Yeah. And that's when the growth of government started. Um, certainly the 17th Amendment, uh, which at some point I'd like to hear what your answer is of repealing that. Mm -hmm. um, and then you were right, the Administrative Act of 1948, uh, uh, 
uh, FDR certainly mm -hmm. created huge amounts of government that never went backwards. The Republicans were too scared to yeah. push some of that back. LBJ. Yeah, I should have mentioned the a a a FDR as well, yeah. yeah. LBJ, the Great Society, turned the nuclear family into a hand grenade. Um, and then uh, obviously Obama, and now we're seeing Biden pushing it and pushing it. So that's kind of where I was going uh, with that. I will wait for my next question to ask about one of the recent Supreme Court uh, decisions that has to do with this. All right. Uh, my next question has to do with the Supreme Court. Well, good. Yes. Are we going to get into a, a, a uh, arms race between liberals and Democrats about how we stack the Supreme Court? And that's what it's looking like now. What are you going to do about it? Yeah, they so they put in a proposal, what, six months ago and then a year ago also, I think. Um, so they, there is people who want to stack the court and that's, or pack the court, stack the court either way. Uh, and that's, I'm definitely obviously super against that. Especially, especially now, and especially because it's driven by political, purely political motivations. This is a horrible, horrible idea. The thing is about that is it could go uh, an extreme right group right could be doing the same thing. So, you know, you keep piling them up there. Yeah. It gets to be the size of the New Hampshire legislature. <laughs> uh, so how do we prevent that? Um, well, it depends what they try and do. If there's a procedural way or if it comes to a vote, certainly I'd vote against it. If they try and, I, I you know, I could try and filibuster or whatever if they try and put, put the appointees. I, mean, I guess it depends what mechanism they try and do. Certainly if it's legislation, if it's something I, I would have the power to do as a senator, then I would do everything I could against it. So would you support a, a, a constitutional amendment to limit the size to a certain thing? Yeah, I haven't thought about that too much. Um, as far as that that a solution, I, you know, I'd be very very cautious about constitutional amendments. But you know, in principle, I think that sounds good. I mean, it de definitely shouldn't be expanded, particularly not for any kind of on a on a political closely basis. related topic. We have uh, uh, conservative judges that pretty much follow the Constitution as written, uh, or as close to it as they can. Their ideology prevent, pres uh, permits. Where, on the other hand, we have uh, activist judges that uh, are going off on all kinds of tangents. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with that and uh, correct that? Well, one of the powers that the Senate has that is a, a unique power in government is that they do confirmations for federal judges and military as well. And uh, a lot of times that, that power isn't flexed much. You know, it's been sort of a rubber stamp for many, many times. And it shouldn't be. It's something that should be taken seriously because we do have, in both cases, and we have General Miley, you know, who's, we have some bad, bad generals at the highest, highest levels of our government. Oh, yes. A general going on, you know, saying the things that he says is absolutely unacceptable. He's not serving our country. He's yeah. bad mouthing his own country, his own president in some cases. Uh, you know, when, when Trump was president, and, and he, you know, he's, he's furthering this idea. You know, when he went on there, it really bothered me that he said, uh, you know, I, I need to understand white rage, you, you, you know, because of one six. That, that, that's a highly charged and ridiculous political statement that even if it was true, which it is not, he should, he has no business making that statement as, as uh, in, in, his, in his position, you know. Um, so military and judges as well. And, and there's a lot of bad judges, I think, and you can look at their record, you know, almost all of the positions that are coming up for confirmation have a good record that you can look at. And I think that should be flexed. They should follow the Constitution. They yeah. should follow the Constitution. Yeah. So, and, and, so if there's and, somebody who's coming up who, who hasn't followed the Constitution. Yeah, most could, of these guys have been uh, put in for life. Yeah. So, um, and I believe you can even fill it, you, you can filibuster it, those, those confirmations. Is it, is it a, a solution that's going to take decades to re, redo, uh, yeah. uh, to fix? Or is it going to be some, some process or some uh, means to change it? Yeah, we, we have, uh, you know, Trump appointed a lot of judges that were pretty good. And so that, you know, that's probably one of his biggest legacies as far as like meaningful actions taken during his, his office. Yeah, I'm not sure how to, how to solve it. And I'm really even more concerned about younger people 
Because we have judges now that are like, I don't know what the youngest judges are, but there's probably judges that are like 30, you know, millennials. Yeah. And these are these millennials and even Gen Z, you know, even worse. The, the school systems and academia and Hollywood and the media have utterly failed two generations now, the millennials and, and Gen Z. And so, so the thought of having some of these, some of these judges or some of these people in this generation, and I don't want to make it too much about generation, there's people with bad ideas of all ages, but I think it's particularly bad because of the education system. You know, the, the, um, the, the difference between some, a baby boomer or my age or a little bit younger is a big difference. You know, my age and older, we all were taught things like, even if we disagree with somebody's speech, it's okay. I remember fifth grade, my teacher explained why, why Nazis should be protected and explained, and he showed the, the illustrations from the ACLU about why they did this, and he explained that they were Jewish uh, lawyers defending this. And I don't think they teach that anymore because there's a lot of people working at the Huffington Post, and, they, and it's this generation and this kind of thinking, some of them could be appointed as federal judges, and they, don't, they believe words are violence, and they don't believe that certain speech should be allowed and they do not understand they think that the that the second amendment is flawed and that the first amendment is flawed they want to repeal citizens united which means what change the first amendment um and they haven't thought about these things they aren't they don't have depth They're certainly not a liberty depth they have very skin deep so i think judges you know working on the on the confirmations for judges is an important role that's been under underdone by senators john well, I'll make a couple of comments. One of my pet peeves is that some people still talk about those people as being liberals. There's nothing liberal about them. Right. They're either leftists yeah. or Marxists right. or find another. They're not progress. They're not a damn. Yeah, the true, a true right. liberal is a classic liberal. Right. I'm a, I'm a right. classic liberal. I it, should probably say that. We all are classical yeah. liberals. We believe in freedom in our right. Um, I should throw everybody off and start using that branding more. Just say liberal. <laughs> and let them ask good. why. <laughs> and um, I keep doing it. <laughs> it the, yeah, I wanted to come on. What's up? You said too, but I can't remember what the hell it is. The trouble with getting old. Um, following up on, on role and size of government, um, maybe not so much a question, but. Um, it's tremendously difficult, it seems to me, to cut the size of government. And one, one way, I'm thinking of multiple ways th that might start to help, and also, to some extent, start reducing the power of Washington, D.C. itself. One, I think, I think we ought to have an objective, uh, not only of cutting the government, but of moving at least half of its employees out of D.C., mm -hmm. at least two or 300 miles away from D.C. I mean, why is agriculture centered in D.C.? It should be in Iowa or California yeah. or right. someplace. Um, and get them out of there, make them live where people are real. Mm -hmm. And yep. they have to live in the world, you know, the real world, and they maybe can absorb a little bit of knowledge about what that means. So I think that's, that's a useful thing, moving them out. Um, uh, a couple of other real pet peeves is, our politicians screw up, so they, quote, shut down the government, and then, because the politicians screwed up, the taxpayers end up funding these people that are met on vacation for a couple of weeks. Well, it put a little bit more pressure on the politicians if you say, hey, we don't, we don't pay these people. Do you politicians screw up? You want to pay them? You pay it out of the politician's pocket, but not out of the taxpayer pocket. So that's one, but, but that sort of gets to the whole thing. A lot of, I believe, of what's going on is, is money laundering taxpayer money through other entities back into the Democrat Party. Mm -hmm. And part of that is government unions, mm -hmm. uh, and part of it is funding for all those environmental groups, uh, immigration groups like 
La Raza and all those things. And every one of them, Planned Parenthood, we give them money, they turn around and give it to the Democrat Party. Mm -hmm. We gotta stop that. Right. Uh, and I, my impression from what you said before is that we could count on you to vote no on that. Now the problem is, you know, you're gonna get a bill and oh, it has all this wonderful stuff in it and it's still got all this crap in it. Yeah. And so what you gonna do? <laughs> well, I don't think most of them do have wonderful stuff. So it's it, there's very few things that I would kind of like fall in love with. And, and if there's something bad in the bill, I just want to vote for the bill. You know, um, in almost every case, you know, they, 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 they would have to be something so extraordinary, uh, you, you know, to do a trade up. Like if there's something that eliminates 10 departments and then does something with one, you know, so it has to be net deregulatory and net shrinking, you know, is what the, what it ultimately has to be. So, so there's not, there's, there's not things that I think are, are good in most of these bills, especially not enough to make me, I mean, there's, there's things like the minor number of things I think are kind of cool. Like I, I, I have a soft spot for NASA. I like NASA. It's kind of neat. I like rockets, but so what? I like comic books too. It doesn't mean I can steal money from you. So we have the National Comic Book Collection. That's ridiculous. You know, let Elon do his thing with private dollars. He gets a lot of public dollars too, but he should do it with private dollars. If it's cool, NASA's then... great, but our billionaires are, are right. doing better with much, much less money yeah. and yeah. their money. Yeah, I mean, it's as far as, you know, how can we fix it? You mentioned when you first started the question, you know, is it it's hard to fix it? And it has been because we've been operating under the rules of the way that things have worked. Well, probably but, because the Republican Center is run by Mitch McConnell. Right. And he believes that there's no value in cutting spending. Yeah. Or any item. Yeah, it, it, these things work until they don't. So I, I wouldn't be so quick to say that it can't be changed quickly. It could change very quickly. It could, and I could be one of the people who helped do, does it because it, it works until it doesn't. The system is really, really, really broken. The debt is completely unsustainable. We are in, in the most fragile spot of almost any country in history. The whole world is shaky and fragile and, bro and broken. It's built on a completely fraudulent financial system. And it's totally unsustainable. You can't print $500 billion out of thin air and give it to BlackRock. Are you out of your mind? That's not, that's not a thing. There's nothing in any economics. There's no Adam Smith book that says like, oh, page 300, if the flu's really, really, really bad, print nine trillion and give 500 billion to your banker cronies and eight, and eight trillion to your other cronies and then it'll fix it. Yeah. That's, not, that's not a thing. And there must be a price that is paid for this. It, it's going to come back and it's gonna come home to roost and it, and it will be economic wreckage, I think. So you could have, you could have radical Unfortunately, it'd probably be the catalyst would be tragedy and maybe even bloodshed and death. But you could see in my term radical cutting of government. And maybe I'll be the one to do that. I mean, I, I think it could get so bad that I could look at Elizabeth Warren herself and say, look, we don't agree on anything and we never have, but look at our country. If, she, if her own family is worried about food, she may come along and even somebody like that may say, yeah, you know, at the end of the day, our country is our country. You got, you, if you just don't have the money and the system is broken, it's unfixable. The dollar is just about unfixable now. So eventually you can't keep up the sham forever. Eventually the house of cards is going to collapse. And even the Elizabeth Warrens and the AOCs and the Paul Krugmans of the world will, will, will and Robert Reich, you know, they'll see it. It will be, uh, there won't be anything they can do about it. Their argument is always going to be, we got to give people stuff to help them out. Yeah. I mean, I, it seems to me the argument these days is our side, which says, given the opportunity and the economy in which they can be, they can prosper, right. and theirs is, give them money. They'll be good, so they'll be grateful to right. us. Right. And, and we got to stop the one, and I'm probably, Taking too much of my time, <laughs> Mr. Norm. Well, I've got a, a couple of things. Um, there are federal proposals floating around Washington these days uh, to federalize the electoral, the election system, yeah. uh, the ballot integrity system, or the ballot uh, lack of backup ballot integrity system, uh, the way we vote around the country. That's one proposal that's floating around. The other proposal is a federal version of red flag laws, yeah. which are floating around. 
And then, you know, you mentioned one of the, you know, the Department of Education seems to be sort of an easy target and every politician focuses, you know, on, on the right seems to focus on the Department of Education. I've got a whole laundry list, but one of my favorites is the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. <laughs> oh! The Corporation for Public Broadcasting. You just why, said nasty. Why in the world do we allocate tax dollars to support the Corporation for Public Broadcasting? Yeah, there's no good reason for it. It's absurd. And I remember a few years ago when they were trying to, you know, scare us with this, oh, Congress is going to kill Sesame Street kind of thing. It's, mm -hmm. just, it's just absurd. And it's even sad, you know, there's this old tearjerker clip of Fred Rogers going in there asking for the funding and he gives a poem and uh, the, 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 the Congress member's like, well, I'm a tough guy, but you brought a tear, I'm going to give you your funding. And to me that, it's, a, it's an interesting thing and I understand why people like it, but to me, it re and I love Fred Rogers, but to me it represents sort of everything wrong with government. And I, I wish that, that, that somebody would have talked to Fred Rogers and said, this isn't, there's so many well-meaning people. I just met one on the street the other day who was asking me about their wonderful issue, a very good issue that is very meaningful and does a lot of good. And they were saying like, will you support this in government? And my polite answer was no. You don't, just because something's good, like Sesame Street doesn't mean you need government. In fact, the fact that it's good is all the less reason you need government. The, the idea that without government, we wouldn't have Sesame Street is utterly, completely, and totally absurd. And I can prove it because I will buy Sesame Street. Do you think I wouldn't buy Sesame Street? Like, oh, oh, it's, we're out of business. Mark, well, we'll yeah, yeah, that for, I'll buy, ago. and you know what? I couldn't afford it because Disney or somebody would buy, it's worth billions of dollars. Well, Jim Henson, which yeah. is behind, was, was behind the Sesame Street originally, had a profit-making venture called Fraggle Rock, right. which mm -hmm. was sold to HBO, and which made a lot of money, and you can still, you can still and buy it. And they make money on the merchandising and the licensing. Absolutely. So, you know, you got PBS doing yep. this thing, and the, the show is produced, and then it's, you know, Carrie's buddies on Beacon Hill who get the, the totally separate, oh no, this is a totally separate company over here that does the licensing and merchandising, right. you know. And, that, and it's interesting, I've been in the studio for the, one of the, the big PBS studio in, in uh, Boston. I've been to a lot of these studios uh, and it's, it's quite interesting, I'm telling. You go in every other studio, in the, everywhere, everywhere you go, even, if, even a big, a big uh, group. I haven't been on Rogan, but I know people who have, even something like that, it's usually pretty small. You go in PBS, it's, it's 30, 40 people. You know, it's just big, everything, you know, big, thick sound rooms that look like they're from NASA, you know, thick walls, every extra doors, you know, it's just, it's it's that's what happens when you have government money and, and these kind of grants and things like that. No discipline. It's a lot of waste. So yeah, point you back to the, the federalizing the elections and federalizing red flag laws. Yeah, I, I, I think that elections should be as local as possible with as much accountability as possible. There's too much uh, potential for centralized shenanigans if it's federalized at the at the at the you know if it's put at the federal level. Um, Red flag laws, absolutely, I'm totally against that. You know, I'm against any any new restrictions. It's too easy to abuse. You gotta always look at everything and you know say, how could this be abused? And and a lot of people don't do that. And I encourage people on the left to do that as well. Because I, 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 a lot of times I say, well, would you want Trump to have this power? You know, if they if they want some new power. Um, and uh, surprisingly, people don't think in terms of systems like this. Uh, so yeah, and there, there was something else you asked about the. Um, the red flag. Red flag, the, um, the federalizing the elections, and then oh, right. cor Corporation of Public Broadcasting. Yeah, yeah right. so yeah, yeah. yeah. against all of them. <laughs> How are we doing on time? It is uh, 7.50. Okay. So we got, uh, what, we're going to 8.30? 8.30? Yeah, okay so we got 30, 40 minutes. Okay. All right, um, this kind of meshes in with cutting government mm -hmm. as well, and also back to the Supreme Court, because as you are probably well aware of, Five important decisions over the last two weeks were handed down by the Supreme Court for different reasons. As much as I love seeing the two religious uh, liberty uh, cases decided, that of Maine, which will open up uh, school choice because you can't discriminate against religious schools, and also the football coach where all he did was just go to the 50-yard line after a game and he eventually got fired for praying silently because students and other coaches and 
other people out of the stands would go and pray with him. They said, that's violating the separation of church and state. Important. New York City's um, gun ban was blown away for, again, violating liberty. But I think the most consequential one from a governmental standpoint was the EPA one. And I've been having a ton of fun uh, discussing in comment sections on socialist sites and eco tree hugger that I started, uh, that I mentioned earlier, and I gotta bring that back to, to Granite Rock. Which basically said that, just like we here in New Hampshire are a Dillon's Rule state, no subdivision of the state can do anything without authorizing legislation passed by the state legislature. EPA got slapped down hard because the Supremes, those that actually looked at the law, looked at the Constitution, decided <laughs> EPA was not an environmental case, it was a separation of power state. Mm -hmm. where, the, where the EPA went rogue because it had no authorizing legislation allowing it to do CO2. That's a specific um, decision against one agency. Do you think, you know, and I'm known for ramming up, the, you know, I'm putting you in the box canyon, big run up and then finally the question. St Steve McDonald, my, the editor for Granite Rock, hates it when I do this. Do you think that there will be a flurry of other lawsuits by those of us who wish to see smaller government against other agencies that have gone rogue mm -hmm. for years, I've said. Every bureaucracy is going to take on more than what their original mission statement said mm -hmm. to justify themselves. Is that a valid way to put government back into that 2% range we were talking mm -hmm. about? Yeah, I'm a big fan of lawsuits, and uh, some of our um, best rights have been sort of uh, clarified by successful lawsuits. You know, some, some, some of the, there's been some some good Miranda rights. You know, think th th there's been a lot of uh, a lot of things that have been done by legislation. You know, legislation, but uh, but but the, the lawsuits is underlooked. I mean, it's it's equally or more important in many cases. There's been some very very important legal decisions and um, so I support that because they, you know there's a lot, a lot of ways you can get a, get because because the Ministry of State and petty bureaucrats and you know elected officials at all levels will just r run right over the law and run right over your, your rights and it's quite difficult to get it in front of a judge in some places it's very clear you know there's rights all the time there's there's, there's violations all the time in New Hampshire and other places of you know 93A access to public meetings or whatever, you know, where, where they, it's not followed, but it's the law. And all you gotta do is get that in front of a judge. And, the, and in many cases, the, 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 the law, the cases are pretty strong, the law is clear. And the judge can, can you know, formalize that opinion and then that then everybody has that to go, especially the, you know, the higher up it goes. You know, you have like uh, Carly Gierke who, who uh, sued about the, um, the right to film police here in New Hampshire, and that went up to the what Supreme Court, state New Hampshire, Supreme New Hampshire Supreme Court. So that's in that's the law that they have to follow. And if I if I want to film a police, and they say no, I can pull up her decision. So those are important. I'd actually like to see more of that, particularly the last couple of years. I was I actually was trying to find lawyers. It's quite hard to find good lawyers who will take these cases here in New Hampshire. There's very 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 few, um, and the key word is good. And then also it's expensive. You do have somebody who's really good. They're often with a big firm and expensive. So finding the right person, a lot of a lot of lawyers are afraid to upset judges. You know, they they don't want to be seen as frivolous. So it, it takes the right combination of everything. To your to answer, yes, I think there will be a flurry because there is the good news is, despite how hard it is, particularly when you want to go to these cases, you know, you want to go up to the state supreme court or something. That's usually uh, involved and often expensive. Uh, but I think there will be. There's a lot. There's there's case at any given time. There's a lot of cases in process, various levels, and these things. So hopefully, there's already good teams. You know, you can name any agency. There's got to be ten good lawsuits. Our kind of people pushing them, and you know. So hopefully, some of these teams are emboldened by what's going on, and they're going to amp it up. And then hopefully, some of these decisions just stand by themselves. You know, there's other people who will be referencing because when it's the Supreme Court, 
they can reference that every other, you know, already I think they're referencing some of these decisions, are, you know, because the lawyers have put it in their arguments like now, like today, they'll say, hey, the Supreme Court said this, and they'll, they'll be using that. So some of the lower courts could uh, use these recent uh, decisions by the Supreme Court to, you know, rule on a lower court level very effectively. Do you think it'll spill down to the, uh, the state level and the local levels as well? I hope so. I hope that the judges are just as upset as everybody else. And I, and I think one good news about judges is that they they should certainly understand the Constitution. They're di different generation. They're, they, they're, you know, I think a lot of them, unfortunately, are brainwashed by woke, nonsensical, fake news media. Uh, but... In law schools. In law schools, yeah, especially the younger ones, you know. Um, but I think at the core... You know they 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 haven't been flexing enough, and and I suspect that there would have been a lot more cases for liberty that were won. I think there was a couple ones that I could have won around masks and different things like that. I couldn't find lawyers to take them. It was very difficult to find somebody. But but I I think that um, you know hopefully the judges are getting upset about this just like everybody else. They must see, and you know I like to think of judges as being very constitutional. I know they're supposed to be. They not always are, but I like to 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 feel that like. You know, and I, I mean, I'd like to, if I had time, I would even take some of these cases myself. I actually talked to quite a good lawyer who was going to advise me. They won't maybe take the case themselves because they don't want to put their name on the reputation, but they'll advise you. So they'll tell you what to say. Somebody who's got a good talker like me, if I have a great lawyer coaching me, say, say this, don't do this, do this, do that, Re follow this procedure, I'm going to help you write this, proofread it, that could actually be effective. And I think people can, can do that. But I'd love to go to some of these judges myself. The reason I say that is I, I, I'd like to... Because I think I could argue it. I mean, it's just some of this stuff is just wrong, and I, and I think it's just un, un fundamentally unworkable. You know, the, for example, schools being able to say your kid needs to wear a political signal. I just don't believe that's a right that they have. I don't believe they have the right to tell you to wear a political signal any more than they have to wear a mask. And I would argue to a judge. I'd go to in front of a judge in New Hampshire, and I'd say, Your Honor. The reason that I'm calling it a political signal is because in my case, there was three or four school board members that we caught who were enforcing masks on the kids and not wearing them themselves. So it wasn't about health. If it was about health, then they wouldn't have been wearing them at the football games and going all around making the kids wear them. If, it was, if they were truly worried, and that's another matter, even if they're truly worried, I say tough. That's a different legal argument. But my specific legal argument, I think is a stronger argument, what it was that it is a political signal. It's a political signal now. The mask is used as a signal to say, look at me, I'm in the church of wealth. Look at me, I'm, I'm better than you. I'm doing the right thing. It's a signal. It's very much a signal. That's why the people are hypocrites about it. You see hundreds of videos online of these, these people where you know they're going out without a mask and they see the camera and they put the mask on. They walk, they'll go without a camera and they'll walk right up to the stage and they'll put the mask on so they can walk from the, from the stage to the podium and then they take it off. It's a show. And that's a signal, that's a political signal. And I got no problem with political signals if they are voluntary, but I, the government, state government, federal government, local government, this is where one, one thing where the state could come in and say, no, you do not have the right. You don't have a right to tell my kid to wear a mask any more than you have a right to tell him to wear a MAGA hat or a BLM shirt or a Democrat shirt or a Republican shirt. It's not your right. It's not your right. It's not your right to tell my kids to wear a political signal. You wanna go wear your own political signal? Go do it at the Church of Woke. And that, and that, I think, is something a judge should, if they agree that it's a political signal, then that should be a cut and dry case. And I think I could make the case that it's a political signal. So anyway, I got off on top, you know, it's the same topic. But, you know, I think that uh, a different kind of act, activism by the citizens is what we need. You know, uh, you know, advocates and activists for the Constitution and more people pushing these, and maybe we find those good judges. I mean, there might be judges sitting there, there's gotta be judges who understand this stuff. And I suspect there's judges sitting right there and, and they just haven't had a case. They may hate this stuff, they may say this is absolutely out of their mind, they're victims of it too. Somebody somebody making their grandkids wear a mask maybe, or, or you know, I'm just using that as an example, could be any other thing. They might be sitting there just ready to smash the hammer down on the tyrants and nobody's brought a case. Because, you, cause, you know, it, it takes all the branches of government. You know, we have, legislative, executive, and judicial. You need the judicial. If nobody brings the case, the tyrants and the administrative state can just walk all over it. They can take your thing and rip it up. It's just like in the movies, you know. Um, they, don't need to, they don't need to pay attention to your rights if they have the, the power of the bully pulpit.
Back to you, Steve. Okay. In this conversation, we have come around that I've got more questions coming now than I had when I came <laughs> in, which is normal. Yes, and which I is know. normal, and it should be. So one of the ones that has come up to me and uh, brought up by these grants that the government uh, passes out willy-nilly to everybody, like uh, 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 br uh, uh, government broadcasting, right. whatever they call it, public broadcasting and all this crap. There should be a limit or at least some guideline as to what is an appropriate field for a government to give a grant to. Mm -hmm. What are they? What no. should it be? Nothing. <laughs> well, I, like I think I think there's uh, uh, certainly some uh, government grants that are worthwhile. I can't name them. Yeah, I, I can't. I can't name any. I can't imagine there would be any. They're all I, worth I think, They're uh, all worth. Yeah, they're worthwhile to this but fat cat country. If they're worthwhile enough, the people who are affected will fund them. Right. One of my pet peeves is Laconia got fifteen thousand dollars to buy AR-15s. I don't know, it was 10 years ago or something, eight years ago. And I figure it probably cost the taxpayers $50,000 to give them that money. Because it got it, it had to cost Laconia two or three thousand dollars at least to, to request the grant and maybe more. It had to cost the government, the, the federal government, thousands of dollars to process it. Yeah. And they did it for hundreds of places. Places that they didn't, whose grants they didn't come through on, right? And and in the end, it's costing us a mint. And if they wanted AR-15s, they could have, out of their million-dollar budget, they could have come up with fifteen thousand dollars, or maybe they only needed six. I mean, it's just friggin' crazy. You gotta stop all federal all all federal money to the states has to stop. I think it just. All right, Michelle. <laughs> so, are you going to go down there to Washington and vote against every one of these grants yeah. that these uh, uh, people come up with? Yeah, hundred okay. percent. I think he's saying he's, if if you're well, if you believe the right target is two percent, you're going to have to vote against everything. Yeah, I'd, just I'd, about. I vote. You know, it's it's across the board. I just vote against all of this stuff. It's it's our money. It's the citizens' money. The yeah. government doesn't have any right to take our money for anything, really. It's, well, it's not I'd even go right for 3%. That they That's what the average was good. in the first hundred. Yeah, like that, about three, about can, I, can I ask one, that. one more question, Fabian, before <laughs> I pass the buck here? I am very big against uh, anti-fire and Black Lives Matter, okay? I consider them domestic terrorists. What's your opinion of them? What do you think? How do you think we should uh, respond to them or deal with them or something like that? Yeah, it's definitely uh, a you know violent ideology. You know, bad bad groups around both of these things. You know, Black Lives Matter originally was just sort of a slogan, but it was very quickly co-opted by you know sort of a group with very bad ideology who's wasted a lot of money stolen a lot of money but most importantly with both groups and especially the the overlap of s some BLM there's some misguided people who just put on a phrase on their Twitter because follow the, some, the, the, the woke police told them to or they were afraid of getting canceled or whatever else but you know there is there is some some people within BLM and especially almost you know, a lot of Antifa people that are you know really really violent and terrible you look at Andy no and other people who follow these kind of things. Uh, it just has no place in, in, in America. And the solution is that we, you know, they, they're violating all kinds of laws and that's gotta be stopped. They can't, you can't just say like, oh, too bad, there's too many of them, we can't, we can't stop it. You just, you just have to have law and order. You can't have people who've worked on their business for 30 years, get the windows smashed and people, you know, I saw these people uh, on a TikTok video last night, they're just driving and they see this big crowd of protesters, you know, like all people in black and the, uh, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, they say, oh boy, are they friendly? And they I don't know. And one of them, sure enough, jumps up on the window, smashes it, window, no reason, no reason, they're just thugs. Uh, and it, it's, a, it's a very bad ideology with bad ideas and ideas that violence is okay, hurting somebody who you disagree with is okay. 
you know, basic caveman level, you know, they're like kindergartners with adult bodies and, and a mind of kindergartners and dangerous and bats, and they'll hit you right over the head with them if, if, you, if, if they, you know, get and their the feelings hurt. And the people, people that uh, support them, like the college professors and that sort of thing, uh, how do you deal with them? Yeah, I mean, we've got, to, we've got to go back to the basics. You know, I mentioned, like, the difference between baby boomers and Gen X versus, versus now. We were taught these things in school. You don't hit people unless they hit you first, period. Mm -hmm. Like, duh, that's third grade level stuff. And they're not being taught. They're, 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 they're being confused by all this cloudiness. They're putting all these new words in the... They're trying to change the definition of what words mean and this new woke ideology... That, that tries to take basic fundamental things, like don't hit somebody if they, you, you know, don't, if they, unless they hit you first. You know, words are not violent. Sticks and stones might break my bones, but words can't hurt me. These are, these are things you, you're supposed to learn five, six, four, four years old even, little, young, young people, and you're supposed to continue to learn that first grade, second grade, third grade. You're supposed to have a foundation in these things by, by fifth grade, very young. Little, little kids are supposed to know these basic things. And now we have 20 and 30 year olds and 40 year olds even who don't know this basic stuff. And they think that it's okay to hurt somebody. You know, uh, you remember the, the, the punch a Nazi? Oh, punch a Nazi, oh, that's so funny. We're gonna punch Nazis. And that, that was a big meme a couple of years ago for, it was, it was all everywhere. And anybody who said, well, hold on, who, who's a Nazi? And is it okay to punch somebody just because they are a Nazi? The, the answer is, Nazis, anybody we think is a Nazi, and number two, even if they were an actual Nazi, an actual Nazi, like I say in the 70s, that's supposed to be defended in the, in the United States, and that's something that's totally lost. If you go to a college campus and say, should Nazis have a right to speak, they're going to say no, and a good chunk of them, Antifa types, think that the Nazi, that, and then I'm talking about actual Nazis, so this is a whole different discussion from what they're doing, but I'm talking about an actual Nazi with an actual armband, should be allowed to speak in America, and is under our Constitution. And there's people who do not know that and do not understand that. And then they've taken, so they've got the very bad ideology idea that it's okay to hurt somebody because you disagree with them. And they start with Nazis. And now what has happened? Very, very, very predictably, the definition of Nazi has expanded to Republicans, sure. Libertarians, Free State, pro-gun people. 60% of the country is probably considered to be a Nazi by 20%. I mean, which is absurd. Yeah. And then and then and then you stretch it like oh okay it's okay to hit that guy in the head because he has a MAGA hat on, and these are these are just these are fundamentally barbaric things that have no place in our society. It's just not workable. You can't have that. You can't have it at all. It's it's just totally totally wrong. Um, so yeah, we we you know we we we've, we've got to put a stop to it. I I, I want to comment on two things and <laughs> then get to immigration because I want to talk about that, but. In terms of rioters, it seems to me, hey, if, if you got, first of all, primarily it's a local problem. Local officials ought to take care of it. Uh, the trouble is that they don't take care of it. They let it happen. Yeah. Then they come to the federal government and say, oh, we need money to repair right. the city. Okay, so federal government ought to be saying, hey, you have the ability to shut that down. And if you don't, you and your local taxpayers get to pay for it. We're right. not paying for it. Yeah. Okay, so, um, and, and I think if you start doing that enough, maybe we'll have an influence. But the, the way things work today is if you're a Democrat supporting rioter, you get off scot-free. Right. And if you're not, well, then look out. Yeah, we have a two-tiered system of justice, too, which is a big problem with, with, big with problem. leftist prosecutors and judges who just let people go out a revolving door for committing oh. lefty crimes. And then they make a mountain out of a molehill with, with, with. I want to float an idea money. or just sort out. You don't need to comment on this, but in terms of, I think we're not really in danger of getting a bill that, that packs the Supreme Court, because I think we got one or two Democrats that are standing in the way at the moment. But maybe we need to start floating the idea that if they pass a bill to suit to pack the Supreme Court. When Republicans take over, which we demo better this fall, we're gonna block every nominee until there's a, 
everyone until there's a Republican president. <laughs> then if they add four, we're going to get four Gorsuches added to the Supreme Court. <laughs> I'd prefer Alito's and Thomas's, yeah. but that's beside the point. Okay, <laughs> but I like that's to... the kind of thing that's a that's a it's a uh, an arms race when it gets to that kind <laughs> of thing, though. Um, but I like the idea of uh, uh, making the cities pay for their own crap. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I I believe the typical libertarian position is open immigration. Uh, looking at your website, you uh, said you believe in uh, essentially open immigration as long as it's legal, as long as they follow the process. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, and I think the process should be really, 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 really easy. Easy. Well, like, easy. like, hey, here I am, come on in. Yeah, well, I, I think there are different levels of our, of our, uh, of our working levels of workers who are more and less able to compete. Um, and if you, for example, you look at the unemployment statistics, at least the last time I checked them, there's significantly, unemployment rates significantly greater for those without a high school degree. Um, uh, and, and that is you work your way up in terms of education level, the unemployment rates you know, fall significantly. So I think we have enough unskilled uneducated people in our country until every one of those Americans has a, a, a job and is self-sustaining. Self um, I don't think we have enough uh, PhDs and entrepreneurs and, and that kind of thing, people who are really going to uh, contribute to the growth of our economy. And I, so I would, I would argue a little bit with that. But um, so getting back to that's the legal part, and we'd have a discussion. So, what about what about two things, the 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 border, and what do we do with the millions of illegal aliens who are here today? Yeah. So, um, I think that I have a position that is the best position for both sides. You know, because you have on one side, and I've talked to a lot of Republicans. That's been my job and you know to win the primary I got to go talk to Republicans I've been a, you know mostly talking to Republicans Republican town committee meetings and so on and most of them tell me what they want is is, is a, a, a solid border and they want the, the law enforced and uh, that's the main thing they want and I think that that can be accomplished now I do talk to people on the other side I talk to people on the left what most of them are kind of all over the place but the general gist is there's a lot of poor people and a lot of people suffering and families separated and people who've been here forever that would be very disruptive to, to society and their families to send them out. You know, there's people who've been here illegally, their kids are legal, their kids go here, all these issues. So with the, the generally, we'll call it left and right, uh, generally a lot of well-meaning people on this side, but the solutions are wrong. The solution so far for many is, well, let's just let everybody break the rules. And then you have two differences. It doesn't work either way. So you have a lot of problems coming, coming with the illegal immigration. And then the people you know, on the right are not happy at all because there's no border and Swiss cheese people coming through. There's, there's, there's issues. Um, I, I think the, the ultimate solution, and I think that both sides could be quite happy if I go to the Republican side or generally Republicans and say, hey, if, if we did have a strong border and we did follow the law, would you be happy? Most of them will say yes. And if I go to the other side and say, if, if these people could have a path to get here or could be here legally, are you happy with that? And the answer is yes. Now, can you just snap your fingers and, and solve it? It's not super easy, but at least if we went to that path, I think we, we could. So to get to, to the 30 million people who are here legally, I think everybody should be here legally. And the problem is, it's just like drug laws and other things. It's just widely ignored because the law is so difficult. We're not supposed to be a place that takes seven years to come here. We had the Statue of Liberty, give us your poor, you're sick, you're tired, you're hungry. You know, we're supposed to be a nation no, of immigrants. Those are welfare laws. Right, well, this, yeah, I was getting to that. Um, because the way to do the solution is uh, you have to get rid of entitlements. Because Americans will never uh, support a more open immigration, freer immigration, easier immigration that I want if entitlements are part of it. And I wouldn't support it either. 
I, I want people to come here and do their own thing and and I want them to pursue a better life and come to America and work. And I, I want everybody to be able to do it, not just PhDs. There is there is uh, unemployment among the less educated, but, but there's also massive uh, um, employment shortage among the employers. So it's, it's that the, a lot of people, a lot of the Americans- Is, is that real or is that artificial because they're yes. getting paid too much by the government? Well, it's right, it's, it, it's, it's partly artificial because they're getting paid by the government they don't want to work. But there is immigrants who want to work because I talked to all the yeah. business owners around here. They yep. don't have anybody who wants to work. You probably go into restaurants and yep. stuff around here. Yep. They're short, they're all short staffed. Yep. Immigrants could fill that, that need, be healthier for the economy overall. Immigration is good if you get rid of the entitlements, because I would never support it with entitlements. You can't say, "Hey, come on over." Oh, by the way, here's eighteen hundred bucks a month or a thousand bucks a month or something. That doesn't. That doesn't. Everybody that's coming in today illegally is getting two hundred bucks yeah. for transportation and they shouldn't get medical anything. care. They shouldn't get education for their kids and yeah, yeah, yeah. Shouldn't get it's anything. It's crazy, right? Um, but yeah, if we get They're rid actually of being bribed to come here. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's true too. Yeah. So yeah, I think if we got rid of entitlements, we could we could make a path path easier so that the, the person who wants to come in legally doesn't have to sit here waiting seven years while a million people come in illegally. You know, there's people in Mexico who've been sitting there for six years waiting to come oh, in legally, I know. Yeah. and meanwhile, ten million people have come I've in illegally. I've talked to people whose, whose wives have waited for years and years. Yeah, so that would be a, a case of you have to reform the yeah. immigration yeah. system, right? The immigration requirements. Oh yeah, it'd make it a lot easier. I mean, way, way, way easier. It should be. It should be easy to come here, especially if you're not a felon. You know, I mean, if you know, we lose a lot of business. I travel a lot. I, I do a lot of business globally, and we lose a lot of business by being so closed. Ever since 9/11, we've been on the since being since, since being so what since, since being so closed up. Since 9/11, we've lost more and more business. You know, we there's a lot of people that would like to come here. The United States has a. a worse and worse reputation globally. It's known by a lot of international business people who would come here and invest as a place that you can't get in, it's a pain in the neck, they're gonna treat you horribly when you get here, and you can't do any business because there's 10,000 rules about securities and every other law. That's what drove all yeah. of our businesses overseas. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna break that off for a little <laughs> bit because it's <laughs> Norm's turn. <laughs> Well, I, what just comes to mind when talking about uh, federal programs and federal grants, um, I had the experience being one of the state representatives that's one of the 18 representatives in Belknap County. We deal with the county budget, and Belknap County received from the federal government so-called ARPA funds of many, several millions of dollars, several millions of dollars. and we had to vote to allocate who's going, who in the county on a wish list that was given to us, a two-page wish list of different expenditures that they wanted to spend the money on. And we had to vote what was appropriate to give this federal money. And when questions were raised by a few people in the delegation about why are we even doing this, the, the answer was given if we don't take the money, some other state or some other county is going to get it, if we don't take the money. How do we combat that mindset? Is there a way to combat that mindset? Well, what, I mean, what, and to, to give you an example, in the, in the Gunstock Ski area, we allocated, we, we voted to give them a million and a half dollars in ARPA funds to air condition a building and to pave a parking lot huh. while they were sitting on cash reserves in excess of $10 million. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the way to stop that, I mean, you can you can try and reject it at a local level. Like you say, it goes back to other states. So it's more of a systemic issue. And in this case coming, you know, the root of it is the federal government itself, you know, printing this money from thin air. And that's just, that problem's really gonna fix itself. There's not a ton one senator can do on that just other than being there at the right moment because it, it won't be sustainable it's not going to work eventually it's going to break probably soon you just can't just can't keep doing it so uh you know 
if I had the power, I mean, if, if, if I had 25 votes in the Senate or something, then I could try and do something about it directly. I mean, I could try, I can do one vote, I can try to caucus with others and so on. But eventually it's gonna solve itself and those votes, are, the, the, those bills are probably gonna pass and that's why I wanna be there. I wanna be there at the beginning to try and get ahead of this stuff. Um, it, we, we just can't keep up business as usual. I, I think it's more likely this, the, the, the situation in the world is gonna stop that than anything I can do. Okay. All set? Set. Okay, we're almost 8.30, so this is gonna be the last question. Okay. There was an interesting post on Instapundit, which is owned by Glenn Reynolds, you're familiar, mm -hmm. okay. Where Glenn had put up uh, an article taken up by the New York Post about how to make the Supreme Court more resilient so that if, you know, with the attempted uh, assassination of Kavanaugh, it would have gotten rid of a lot of these latest decisions mm -hmm. because it just would have ground to a halt. Mm -hmm. So he had the idea that perhaps the president uh, puts in five judges, the Senate puts in five judges, and then each of the state legislators uh, would put in two judges themselves. So make it a huge Supreme Court, so not so much packing it. And then somebody wrote, and I, had, I was having my own thoughts as I was reading this description, and yes, it would make it more resilient and all of that. And somebody just said, well, Glenn, why don't you just get rid of the 17th Amendment and make senators part, uh, you know, once again, appointed by their state legislators. And so there's a lot of laughing going on about that. So the question would be, would you, if given the opportunity within the first six months of being a senator, vote yourself out of office? Because it's probably not likely that our state legislature would vote you vote to keep you there? <laughs> yeah, I like the idea of put it. Maybe they would though. It might change. Um, <laughs> I think they're going to like me. I think everybody in New Hampshire is going to like me if I get down there. I'm exactly what we need. I'm exactly the message that we need to send down there. But uh, yeah, I would vote to. Uh, it's an issue I'd like to study more. But generally, my feeling and understanding on repealing of, of the Seventeenth is that it would you know, put more power in the, in the hands of the states. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of reducing federal power and I'm in favor of reducing my own power. One of the things I looked into in, in going down there is just like, what, what things can I do even personally? I mean, your own budget, for example, you know, you get a budget, I think it's around 3.5 million for this seat. And uh, I'd like to see how, what the record is. I, I'm, I'm a disruptor. So, so you could expect me to do things quite differently, you know, a, breaking records and you know I'm the type of person to say well what's the what's the lowest anybody's ever done let me see if I can can I run it for 250 you know can I can I return th 3 million a year to the taxpayers that's just it's more of a gesture honestly but I like the idea of, of mixing it up and 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 you know kind of uh, breaking things a little bit so something like that is the kind of thing that I would do and you know maybe have people call me Bruce and and you know reduce some of this this pomp and and you know ceremony around it. You know I don't think a senator should be a big deal. I don't think you should have entourages. And I mean a lot of these folks are really, 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 really out of touch. I mean, it's, it, I mean Nancy Pelosi on, on the congressional side. Like I don't know anybody in the public eye that seems that out of touch. Like I don't has she had a has she? I mean forget you guys, but like is she even capable of like sitting down and having a conversation like this? Even with people on her own side, I don't think so. I don't see any evidence of it. You know, I see a lot of people that are really, 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 really out of touch. So, yeah, I'd like to vote myself out of a job. I'd like to, I'd like to, I don't want to do the job. I don't want to go down there. It's a viper infested swamp. One thing I looked at was, can you win and just not show up? The answer is no. The sergeant at arms of the Senate has the power to compel you. And I believe he has the ability to use federal resources. So I think they can make, they can literally make the FBI show up at my farm and yeah. drag me down there. And I think that might, you may know actually, did that happen a couple times in the 1800s? I think they, they had some, oh, some senators uh, who didn't feel like I, showing up, you know, they made I them think, come down. I think I'd buy right. a ticket to that. You should, you should <laughs> run for the House. There are still yeah. Democrats. Yeah, representatives yeah. haven't been there for a year. Yeah, right? that's the, I'd love well, to do that. If I, I, I have four beautiful children, and I think I have one of the, the nicest places in, in New Hampshire, although this view, <laughs> boy, oh boy, I mean, I do not have this view. I don't, I, nobody I've seen in New Hampshire has this view. So um, 
the I people next door. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to go down there. You know, I don't want to go down there and do that. So, so I would, uh, you know, I, would, I, I, I resist, um, you know, being in the swamp. So I, I want to reduce the power. I don't want to go down there and play the politic games and join the, the board of the Kennedy Center. And do, I'd probably do almost, you know, no meetings. Like, I'm going to be very, very, very unconventional if I do, just like my campaign has been unconventional. I march by my own beat. I do my own thing. I'm a disruptor. I could care absolutely less than zero about what Mitch McConnell tells me to say, or these political games, or these consultants, and these PACs, and these people say this, and this thing does this, and this handler says that, and absolutely less than zero interest in that. I want to do the bare minimum of what they say, the times that I'm required by law to be there, I'm going to be there, vote no almost every single time on every single thing, and then get the heck out of Dodge. The minute I'm allowed, I'll jump on a plane and go back home and spend the time here. Um, so yeah, I would rather reduce the power. Re redu it wouldn't surprise me if I get in trouble down there. I'm a troublemaker. I'm the kind of guy you could expect to see removed from the... I wouldn't have complied with the vax, uh, any vax pass or the mask. Absolutely not. Absolutely zero chance. Mark my words. I promise you and promise as promise can be, I will never, ever, ever comply with a vax mandate, a vax pass, movement pass, or a mask. If I'm on duty on the Senate floor, they can remove me by police. I could spend the entire six years in a cell if I have to. I'm never, ever going to do it. I'm not going to do it. If they want to remove me by police, they can do it. I can sit outside and have, run my Senate office from the street in front of the Capitol building. I can go back home. I will not comply with these things, ever. Absolutely not. So there's things like that that I would be a disruptor on and rock the boat a little bit um, and definitely decrease my power. And they may decrease my power. Wouldn't, wouldn't, like I say, wouldn't surprise me if I get in trouble. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a boat rocker. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a disruptor. I'm somebody who's going to go down there and cause trouble. And hopefully I cause enough trouble that I get in trouble. I hope, I'm, I hope it's national news, like how bad, you know. And, and I, I really, really, really can't emphasize to you how little I care about this job and how little I want the job. I do not care. I do not care if there's some one of these situations like on these Fridays when everybody goes home on a Thursday and they're open for one minute and it will be strategically advantageous to Liberty to do a quorum call and go in there and make everybody wreck their weekend. I don't care. I don't care if everybody hates me. I don't care if they arrest me. I don't care if they run somebody against me in the primary six years from now. I don't care about anything like that. I don't even want to be down there. I care about liberty. I care about my family. I care about these principles. And that's what I do. I go down there and do exactly what I say. And I say this to every single group that I meet in New Hampshire. I vote exactly how I say I'm going to vote. Well, Bruce Fenton, I want to say thank you very much for spending two hours with Grant and Crot. This has been exactly what I was hoping for. But Great. Since you are not the typical Republican that comes through uh, to these gauntlets. So I have enjoyed this. Great. I think uh, when we put up the video, uh, there will be a number of Liberty and Freedom folks that will uh, enjoy listening to this because we are here not so much for ourselves, but we try to represent our readers as well mm -hmm. in these kinds of settings. So thank you very much for coming all the way up here to meet with Granite Cross. Thank you, and thanks for all you do. You know, I got interviewed by Salon the other day, and it was actually pretty accurate. They meant to be a hit piece talking about guns. They say he wants to take a, take away the gun laws, and I'm like, well, that's good. And so you're doing a service uh, on the other side. You know, you're, you're you're getting good information to your audience, and that's good. So I commend you guys for what you've done and what you've built. It's really impressive, and you've got uh, your reputation precedes you. So it's it's my honor to be here. So thank we you. are just a bunch of volunteer misfits for liberty and freedom. Perfect. And we don't care who you are. We don't care whether you've got an R, an I, a D, a G, an S, a C. If you violate the U.S. or New Hampshire constitutions and the conservative planks of the NHGOP, we're, we'll come after you. And if you say something, we'll do it again. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. Awesome. Clock TV.